Hello, this is John Wallace, Senior Editor at Laser Focus World, and welcome to today's webcast brought to you by Laser Focus World Online. Today's event, Acceleration versus Error, Balancing Performance for Cylindrical Laser Processing Applications, will be presented by Scott Schmidt, Group Manager of the Laser Processing and Micro Machining Group at Aerotech. Following the talk, we'll have a short question and answer session. You can ask questions at any time during the presentation by using the Q&A box that you see on your screen to submit. Before we begin, I'd like to first cover a few housekeeping items. At the bottom of your audience console are multiple application widgets you can use. If you have any questions during the webcast, you can click in the Q&A box and submit your question. We will try to answer these during the webcast, but if a fuller answer is needed or we run out of time, it will be answered later via email. We do capture all questions, and, and I do encourage submission of questions if it really adds to the um, latter part of the webcast. A PDF copy of today's slide deck is available in the resource list widget that looks like a green folder at the bottom of your screen. You can expand your slide area by clicking on the Maximize icon on the top right of the slide area or by dragging the bottom right corner of the slide area. If you have any technical difficulty, please click on the Help widget. It has a question mark icon and covers common technical issues. If you require additional assistance, please type your issue into the Q&A box and one of our webcast technicians will assist you. For your convenience, this presentation will be available on demand within 24 hours of this live event. A reminder email message will be sent to all registrants with a link to the archive. It will also be accessible from the home page at www.laserfocusworld.com. Now it gives me a great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Scott Schmidt. Thanks, John. Uh, so, of course, we're looking at the title slide now, and thank you very much for taking time out of your busy schedules to join us. Um, and today's topic will be acceleration versus error for cylindrical laser processing applications, maybe colloquially known as stent processing. Uh, you'll see that most of the examples that I speak to throughout the presentation will look at what might be recognizable as typical stent types of profiles and shapes and parts. But we might generalize the topic for, as the, as the slide title infers, cylindrical laser processing in general, which could include hypotubes, guide wires, catheters, things like this. So please don't think that this is a narrow topic specific only to one device. As we go throughout today's presentation, I hope to hit on a couple of key points namely a review of the application in general for cylindrical laser processing, looking at what are the challenges within that application space. Uh, typically, those might be thought of as the part error or the part accuracy, uh, how true it is to the path, the form error in other words. Throughput, of course, because everybody is interested in processing parts as, as swiftly as possible. And what are the limitations on the hardware choices? In other words, what does a typical laser processing uh, cylindrical laser processing center look like. After we feel like we have a pretty good understanding of the performance challenges, we can investigate optimization techniques. In other words, once we know what uh, a performance curve might look like, and we'll delve into that pretty deeply, how do we improve it? Or how do we judge where we should expect to live on that performance curve? Along the way, we'll look at very specific tools that might help us understand where the, where the performance limitations are in our application, but furthermore and more importantly, how to optimize uh, the, the application overall. And lastly, we'll take, we'll take a few minutes to talk about future work, some forward-looking ideas, and what are some other topics that might be adjacent to this presentation that are worth thinking about as a result of what we discussed today. In general, stent processing, or generically, cylindrical laser micromachining, has a part that has a very, very complex shape. The image to the right of the slide in the middle uh, has this cylindrical shape that would worm its way or be deployed uh, using a guide wire in, into the patient's artery or any other, quite frankly, any other vessel within the body. Uh, this could be a neural stent, uh, cardiovascular, thoracic. Um, but then 
has, has this characteristic scaffolding shape to it that allows it to be collapsed such that it can be deployed through the body's vessels and passageways, and then expanded and hold its shape against the walls of that vessel after deployment. Because of this very unique scaffolding shape, processing the parts can be challenging. The typical part profile, as we see, infers a lot of different direction reversals. There's not the opportunity to reach a constant speed and stay there throughout part processing, typically. Uh, in fact, as we look at the bottom image on this slide, this is what you might imagine a typical stent looking like after it has been unrolled into a flat shape. It's interesting to look at the, at the shapes this way or to think about them this way because truly, this is how the application is developed. This is how the part profiles are, are generated. This is how the machine code is written to process the, these types of parts. We unroll them into a flat sheet and we look at this as a two axis problem. Uh, one axis that would be, let's say, uh, left to right on that image toward the bottom would be the linear axis uh, that, that, that exists underneath a fixed point laser. The other axis, up and down in that flattened image at the bottom of this slide, would be the rotary stage that turns our cylindrical workpiece underneath this, this fixed laser point or laser tool delivering the beam so that we can carve out this very specific curving scaffolding shape out of the substrate. Once again, we have very high dynamics in this kind of application. Uh, in fact, this is the fundamental limitation on throughput for the devices. Because there are so very many direction reversals throughout part processing, this forms the limitation in how fast we can cut a device for a given part profile and a given set of motion mechanics. Because we must realize that we don't have infinite torque on that rotary and we don't have infinite force on the linear stage. And of course, because there are not very many straight line segments in part processing, peak acceleration defines the throughput time. In other words, we will find, or maybe it's already obvious to you, that the, the maximum velocity that you choose to travel may not be the limiting factor for cycle time. Rather, it's the acceleration, the ramp rates, the rate of change of that, acceler of that velocity that defines the part throughput time. If we look at structurally what a cylindrical laser micromachining center might look like, we can view what it's looked like over the past. Uh, the mechanical choices, as I've inferred before, explicitly stated before, are a rotary stage that sits on top of a linear stage. The rotary stage holds the cylindrical workpiece, the part that will eventually be turned into the stent. And that circular workpiece, that cylindrical workpiece, is actuated underneath a fixed laser beam, typically. And so we can move back and forth in the linear axis and circularly in the rotary axis to expose different parts of the workpiece underneath the static beam. So as we do these, these uh, very high speed motions, but more importantly, these high rate of change direction reversals, the moving mass that the linear carries uh, becomes a limitation, and the rotational inertia that the rotary stage has also is a limitation. So we begin to think about the problem maybe uh, in, a, in a more systemic view where we consider what is the moving mass to force ratio of that linear stage and the rotating inertia to torque ratio of the, of the rotary stage and use that as a figure of merit for what my expected throughput should be. There's a bit more to it than that that we'll discuss, but that's the essence of the compromise and the trade-off. So many, many years ago, in the mid to late, teen, in the mid to late 1980s, the original generation stent cutting systems were not optimized at all. They were purely component solutions and quite frankly cobbled together from whatever components happened to be at hand. Generation two, a few years later, did have more of a mind to optimize this, uh, especially the inertia to torque ratio of the rotary stage because it became apparent that that was the limiting factor in part processing times. And so the second generation platform was still component based but it did have a mind towards what was most important about the application. The third generation, or what I might term the current generation, have fit-for-purpose designed from the ground up systems that are not component-based. Rather, they recognize where the biggest challenges are in stent processing and try to address those from a clean sheet design instead of simply bolting together a linear stage and a rotary stage together. 
So that this third generation stent cutting system addresses the third bullet point on this slide. In other words, the system optimization is not, an, is not a mere afterthought for the third generation cutting systems and what I would term modern cutting systems today. We've already mentioned that the ultimate benchmark for these kinds of applications is cycle time. How long does it take to make a part of a given profile? Uh, how many seconds, how many minutes does it take for me to completely cut that part and be ready, indexed, and waiting for the next part to be processed? The second point, if you walk away from this presentation understanding or, or appreciating any, any of the information that I have to share with you today, it's this second point. It's a recognition that the dynamic errors, the form errors in the part, come from the change in velocity. Acceleration and deceleration causes all the heartache in this application. All of the errors that, that are worth thinking about come from this acceleration and deceleration. The more we can mitigate that, either with a more optimal mechanical design, better and more responsive electronics, or simply an appreciation of how to limit the acceleration and still get the part, the part throughput, those are, those are the tactics we should be imagining and should be considering to get better behavior out of this application. So if we understand that the benchmark is cycle time, the form error comes from accelerations, then it's reasonable to think that the comparative curve or the grade or benchmarking we should have to compare different stent processing systems ought to be cycle time versus part error. Here we have an example of a collection of curves for different types of stent processing systems. If you'll forgive me as I jump back and forth maybe from a couple of slides ago, we can see that the curves in the dark blue and in the fuchsia pink and in the very light green at the top, especially the, uh, the top two, the ALS 25000 with ASR 1200 and with the uh, ALS 25030 and ADRT stage, those are very similar to the Generation 2 stent cutting systems. As we imagine again uh, what the Generation 3 stent cutting system would look like with a fully integrated solution, this is the type of curve we might see toward the bottom, the, the pale blue vasculate line or the laser turn one line where we have a system that, that is designed purpose built with this application in mind. And we'll have the opportunity maybe to talk a little bit of what that optimization is and what those design trade-offs are on, on the next few slides coming up. So why are the curves different? Well, I have alluded to it a little bit, but the mechanical design does have obvious influence on the behavior or on how low or how high on that cycle time versus error curve any given system will be. So these kinds of mechanical designs uh, the design considerations maybe that are important are things so, uh, that are shown in the sub-bullet points. It's important to drive through the center of mass so that we don't have any sort of yawing moments uh, in, as we move back and forth or create any sort of strange resonances in the system that are difficult for even an advanced control system to mitigate. We'd like to support about the center of stiffness. Um, so we need to make sure that our bearings are located about the center of mass or about the center of stiffness, most importantly, of the system so that we don't have any rebounding or so that we don't have any unpredictable compliance in the system that causes more error in the part after we are done. And lastly, we would like to sense position at the work point. We'd like to get our position encoders that the stages look at to know where they are in space. We'd like to get those as close to the, to the laser spot as we can. So clearly, all three of these cannot be achieved perfectly simultaneously. So we seek the best optimization of those three things. And, th and that's really what that third generation stent cutting system tries to achieve. And what many manufacturers, um, not, not only Aerotech, but many manufacturers have attempted to achieve is essentially an optimization of these three mechanical challenges. And oh, by the way, in general, lower mass, lower moving mass, and smaller rotating inertia is a good thing. Um, for the obvious reasons, that if we have a smaller mass for a given motor, then that moving mass to, uh, to force ratio becomes smaller, which is a positive development for processing these. What that means functionally is that for the same acceleration, we'll have a smaller part error if we can, if we can optimize that mass to force ratio and that inertia to torque ratio. 
although not explicitly shown on the set of sample curves that we looked at two slides ago, the electronics and controls and amplifier choices can also influence what that cycle time versus part error, uh, cycle time versus part error looks like, or cycle time versus acceleration curve looks like. We can find that pulse width modulated uh, amplifiers, although more compact and less expensive than their linear counterparts, they do have some what we would term a dead band effect when it's time to change the directions of the current command into the motor of the amount of current pushed through the motor windings as we cross that zero point going from positive to negative or in the other, other direction negative to positive when we change the sign of the current there is a moment in time however small that no current is passed with a linear amplifier this is truly an analog curve uh, it, it, there is no discrete amount of time at which you are zero. It's, it's uh, an infinitesimal amount of time by definition. However, with the PWM amplifiers, many are optimized to avoid this, and higher switching frequencies helps this. But in general, there is some non-zero non amount of dead band that can show up as an acceleration error at those direction reversal points. Furthermore, we have advanced, the ability to implement advanced controller features that we'll talk about probably a little bit more in the future work. But uh, advanced tuning algorithms, um, features that try to overcome bearing friction at these very, very tight radiuses, radii, and, and very, very small moves that we are making for these very tiny stent parts. It's important to consider some influences that exacerbate these design challenges. Recently, device size generally is pushing towards smaller and smaller devices. The medical community seeks to employ stents into smaller passageways. Uh, neural stents particularly become smaller and smaller. Material choices are changing. At the beginning of the advent of stent processing, at least by cylindrical laser micromachining techniques, the parts were generally made out of stainless steel. Uh, then nitinol types of materials were processed, but, steer, but still bare metal. Recently, the stents are processed uh, with a polymer coating which sometimes are applied afterwards, sometimes not, uh, but, but may complicate the, the manufacturing steps. And most recently, the notion of having polymer-based stents, non-metallic workpieces, has arisen. And this, in particular, uh, can be a challenge because the polymer materials are not always laser-cut, as bare metal stents have been. Rather, many of them use very, very small pulse width lasers and use in effect a thermal ablation to blast away or ablate away uh, layers of the material of processing instead of cutting through it in one pass because seeking to cut, it, cut through it in one pass can deform the stent or change its material bit shape or behaviors in a way that bare metal stents don't behave. So if we, if we decide that we would like to use this athermal ablation technique, um, oftentimes, it's, it's necessary to process the same pattern on the same workpiece multiple times because a limited amount of material or a limited thickness of material can be ablated away during one pass. So now we recognize that we have smaller workpieces uh, that, that now in for smaller rotary stages and that inertia to torque ratio now becomes worse and worse, but even worse yet, we might need to retrace the same pattern multiple times, increasing the throughput by an integer number of times. The smaller workpieces in particular start begin to pose more and more challenges. If I have a very tiny diameter workpiece, any sort of error motions in either the workpiece or the collet, the workpiece holder, uh, but I speak directly of, of things like radial error motions, can walk my very small part that might have a, a 200 micron diameter out of the laser beam and cause me to not process where I want to where I want to be. So if I seek to have a, a, high, a, a better precision workpiece holder, a better call it, generally that means that I have to have a larger engagement area of the call it holder against the call it, which means a larger call it holder, which means higher rotating inertia. All the while, while I have a smaller a smaller rotary piece that infers higher accelerations to achieve the same land speed that I have at the, at the stent surface. So all of these problems build on each other and exacerbate one another. So now finally, let's, uh, we, 
We've stated some of the problems. Let's talk about the solutions, the optimization techniques. We've already covered the mechanical analysis. Um, I'd like to spend most of the remaining time talking about control features and things to consider uh, on, on the path planning and how we accelerate and how we decide what velocity to choose, for instance. Um, the velocity acceleration considerations are the largest uh, and the most important topics to consider. We will talk a little bit about tuning and also about the profile optimization. In other words, how we would change the code that we use to actually process the parts. To begin with velocity, uh, there's a couple of tools that most advanced controllers have. And I think it's fair to expect the controllers to have these kinds of features. First, we have a look ahead. And I put that in quotes. That's uh, maybe a, a bit of jargon. But basically, um, this, is, this represents the controller's ability to take a view further ahead in the part profile, to anticipate moves that are coming up, and not just worry about the given arc or circle or straight line that, I, that it happens to be processing at the given moment, but appreciate what moves are coming downstream so that it can blend them all together into a more smooth profile. And if you can imagine what I mean by more smooth, I mean fewer sharp points, fewer very, uh, very um, high impulse acceleration areas. So if my controller can look ahead, blend the moves together, and have a nice smooth profile, then I can mitigate these high accelerations, which as we know, cause all of the part errors. The second bullet point for velocity on uh, infers that after each move, I should be smart enough um, with my controller to not decelerate to zero between each move. An example is shown here, where the top curve has velocity on engaged, where I can, again, look ahead, appreciate what the next move is in, in the sequence, and not ramp down to zero and not waste time and impart extra accelerations into my workpiece and extra errors into my workpiece, truly, but instead maintain my velocity, anticipate the next move coming up, and blend all of those together seamlessly and very smoothly. So now that we've talked about optimizing the velocity profile and smoothing that out, let's agree to, agree to accept that it's really all about the acceleration and managing that. And in fact, you might have noticed even as, as we discussed these last points, all of the velocity management is purely with, with in mind to, make, to, to manage or to limit the amount of unnecessary accelerations that we have in the part. All of the bad part profile stuff, all of the dynamic errors that we have come from the accelerations. If I'm not moving at all, clearly I have no part errors. If I'm moving at a constant speed, I should have no dynamic errors. The only errors I should see in my part at constant velocity should come from geometric errors in the stages. If my stage is not very flat or straight, or I have bad radial errors in my workpiece holder or my rotary stage. The velocity that I select should agree and be compatible with the laser that I choose. In other words, I don't want to process faster than my laser can fire. Um, I want to achieve a reasonable cycle time, and we'll look at some curves toward the end of the presentation that might give you some hints as to select that optimal velocity, because it will come down to the acceleration. We will find that for a given part, we should select what error we can tolerate. That will back out or infer to us an acceleration we can, that, that we can use for our part processing, and this will also deliver to us the cycle time. So once we've arrived at or converged on a solution for that maximum part error, we can decide what the acceleration is from that, and then everything else backs out of that, out of that one salient choice. The acceleration consideration or mitigation strategies for, for limiting accelerations and still getting good part processing times can be broken down into three different domains. So the easiest one to imagine is, how quickly can I ramp up to speed when I'm going in a straight line? So most motion controllers, I, I might say all motion controllers, can do this pretty well. Um, however, it's not, it's not so important. In my sort of cartoonish example that I show on this slide for a stent pattern that's been unwrapped, uh, there are some straight lines. But, but as you might observe, there are far more curves and bends and, and direction reversals. So the straight line acceleration probably is not so interesting. 
The second domain of accelerations that I should, with which I, can, I should concern myself have, have to do with non-tangent moves. When I, go, when I hit a sharp point in my, in my profile, when I'm going around a corner, uh, this is different from a radius or different from tracing a circle. Rather, these are non-tangent moves. These are, these are sharp points in my profile. Most controllers, most, most of the more advanced controllers have features to have this so-called coordinated acceleration limit, where I can anticipate the fact that if, as I travel from point A to point B, I better start slowing down in the Y direction, in, in the vertical direction on this plot, um, in anticipation of coming to zero so that I can speed up in X and maintain some reasonable acceleration coming around there, some reasonable vector acceleration as I, as I hit that corner at B and accelerate towards C. The last bullet point on here is that we're talking about limiting acceleration, but what this really does is it, it's, it's, a, it's a velocity reduction strategy. So we're going to reduce the peak velocity that we see in our part because we've put a ceiling, we've put a cap on the acceleration that we will allow these stages to experience. And we put that cap on acceleration once again because we want to, we want to mitigate the errors. The third domain of acceleration management is in circular moves. So for that one, uh, the second bullet point applies. And this is that the tangential acceleration around the curve is equal to the velocity squared divided by the radius. So clearly, the two knobs we have to turn are the velocity and the radius if we want to maintain a fixed acceleration. The radius is not going to ch change. That's handed to us as part of the part profile. So at any given feature on our part, we have an established and fixed unchangeable radius. Instead, the only mitigation strategy we have is once again to lower the local velocity at that point. And that's maybe the most uh, an important nuance to talk about. Um, for suitably advanced motion controllers, uh, this velocity regulation or, or management that we can call um, happens at the motion controller level. The user doesn't decide or ha the user shouldn't be burdened with making this computation at every curve, at every circle, uh, to decide by how much I should slow down my velocity to mitigate the part errors, to, to keep um, some maximum acceleration. Uh, rather, the controller should have, as I put in quotes here, some coordinated circular acceleration limit. Um, I should be able to tell the controller, around circles, don't accelerate more than this. And then the controller figures out how, how high the velocity can be for any given part feature on my profile. But once again, this does infer a velocity reduction. We manage the acceleration by lowering the, 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 the uh, desired velocities. So we've managed our accelerations. We've hammered them down to the point where we know that at no, part do, at no point during our part profile are we going to exceed uh, some limit on the acceleration, regardless of what the move profile is or how those moves are stacked up one end to end to end. We know that the controller is going to be smart enough to look forward, to limit my velocity, to blend the moves together, and not exceed some fixed acceleration. Well, the rest of it is just optimization. We've already talked about the mechanical optimization with driving through the center of mass, supporting about the center of stiffness, and sensing position as close to the work point as possible. So the rest of it is, or the rest of it is control optimization. Um, just about every motion controller out there has some level of auto-tuning. And essentially, you inject some amount of energy into the system, usually by oscillating the, the stage back and forth. And that allows the motion controller to measure a couple of important attributes of the system, uh, namely the inertia and the system friction. And using those two measurements, and with some expectation from the user of what, what response rate, what bandwidth he wants out of the, the system, and what crossover frequency and, and, and uh, stability, phase margin, that he wants out of the system, uh, we can compute a, system, a set of system gains and try to deliver that performance. After we have that, uh, we might consider exciting the system across a broad spectrum of, of frequencies, generating frequency response plots, or, or so-called Bode plots, and manually tuning up the system for better response at whatever, whatever rates that we think are important. Uh, whatever system bandwidth we think we need to achieve out of it. Um, the most capable motion controllers ought to do both, uh, and they ought to, be, ought to be able to do both essentially automatically. They ought to be able to perform this auto-tuning and then automatically, not manually, but automatically perform this aggressive tuning of, uh, of shaping the, the frequency response plots. So here's an example of what 
a before and after system optimization might look like. The blue curve is before any kind of optimization. You might imagine that this is only after doing some very basic auto tuning that, that uh, most, most of the rank and file controllers can achieve. And the red plot is either after some manual aggressive kind of tuning or advanced auto tuning um, that, that, that some motion controllers can achieve. The general point to take away, uh, we can talk more about this later if there are specific questions, but the general takeaway here is that the red line you might notice in the middle of the curve where it states that the crossover frequency is pushed further to the right. So what this means is that the system is more responsive. It can reject disturbances of higher frequencies. It can achieve moves inferred by higher frequency content. So this means it's a more nimble system. Um, in general, the overall magnitude of the gain the, of the top curve, the top is gain, the bottom one is the, is the phase, uh, the magnitude of the red line is higher than the blue line at most frequencies. Again, inferring that it, it has better responsiveness across frequency and is able to reject disturbances at higher frequencies. Lastly, we, as far as an optimization technique, we can talk about the actual profile itself. Um, this doesn't mean that you're going to change the shape or the geometry of your part. Again, that's hand to test, that's fixed. We, don't, we can't decide how big of a circle we're gonna, we're gonna trace here. We're assuming that that level of optimization has already been performed and is fixed. In other words, the device characteristics demand that it has the shape that it does. And the only changes we can make are in how we execute those shapes. We're not gonna change the form the only knobs we have to turn, again, are velocity and acceleration so that we can get the best possible device at the optimal cycle throughput. This is one two-dimensional plot generated by, by a motion controller that's looking at the error, um, in other words, the, the encoder uh, information coming back from the rotary and the linear stage, and this is plotted in a two-dimensional sense. And it plots all of the errors as well as the overall command. It may be difficult to see in this view of the slide, the next slide will have a close-up view of it, but if you squint real hard, you might see that some very, very tiny portions on the bends and some of the curves are red and not blue. It's at those points that are, that are plotted in red that the two-dimensional error, the vector error in the part exceeded some threshold. For the sake of this exercise, I made that threshold uh, 0.5 microns of dynamic error. So this was a, a very high dynamic system on which we plotted this. What this infers is that only at those very tiny corners do I have a part error that's worse than 500 nanometers. At all the other places where it's all blue, it means that I'm a half a micron or better for my following error, for my dynamic error on the part. So let's maybe take a closer look at this. Where the red crosshairs are in the center of this plot, is one of the spots where I had that red error, where I've exceeded that half micron tolerance or threshold that I've defined myself. Toward the bottom of this same image, you can see that there is a, a test.pgm. This is my motion control program. And when I click my crosshairs on that red portion, I can identify the line of code in my program that was being executed when that, when that bad error occurred. So if I choose to, I can decide I want to make sure that all, at all points on my part profile, I want one micron of error or less. I can plot this two-dimensionally, as we saw on the last slide, identify all the red areas, click on them, and identify the handful of lines of code that are giving me problems. And perhaps just on those lines of code, I decide to lower my acceleration by 5% or 10% or whatever number it takes to be able to get that back into, uh, in, in, to turn all of the parts of my curve blue. So I don't need to apply a global sledgehammer of acceleration reduction across all points of my profile. Rather, I can, I can apply a fine tool, a fine scalpel instead, to shave down the errors point by point only at the points where it's most painful for me. So this is another level of optimization we can entertain. And lastly, we have advanced features. I've mentioned a lot that we are going to allow the motion controller to deliberately change the velocity command. We know that acceleration is what matters, not velocity, if I, want, if I care about my form error. So the controller has to have the latitude and the flexibility and freedom to change the, the velocity. 
If I do that, I can no longer use fixed frequency firing and just hope that I'm traveling at a constant velocity. Other words, otherwise, uh, I risk stacking up a whole bunch of laser energy when I happen to be moving at a slow velocity and having inadequate laser energy on my part to cut it or to ablate it when I'm moving very, at a very, very high velocity. So instead, it becomes important to allow the, con the motion controller to issue the laser firing commands. And some lasers accept this capability very, very readily from the motion controller. Some do not. Some like to have their own master clock and have uh, pulse on demand or, or so-called mode lock lasers um, as another class that can only be fired on their own clock. And that's okay. Uh, the motion controllers that are, that are in the marketplace these days have the ability to synchronize with those clocks and still gate the laser and demand the laser energy uh, in a fashion that's compatible with the, with the instantaneous velocity and in, a passion, and in a fashion that's still compatible with the laser itself. And then the last bullet point on this slide speaks about maybe future work for other advanced controller features. Uh, one, one that is out there is this so-called enhanced tracking control, where we can measure the small scale friction that the system encounters whenever we're making radius uh, curves that have radii of tens of microns. Um, there's different friction behavior there where, where the bearings might skid a little bit instead of rolling. And so it's important for the motion controller to be able to measure that and to be able to have sets of gains and responses to it that address that friction behavior instead of the rolling element fr friction that we typically see in long haul moves. So la the last topic on our outline was future work. There's a few things that we might consider. Um, one is, as I've alluded to before, tracing another set of curves that look at pulse width modulated amplifiers against linear amplifiers, or maybe even different classes of PWM amplifiers. Uh, there, not, not every amplifier is created equally. Um, we can look at, at more cost-effective ones and their behavior and their performance compared to perhaps more exotic or more expensive ones and see if there really is any bang for that buck, if there's any reason to use more expensive amplifiers. Uh, the enhanced tracking control that we just discussed on the last slide is another characteristic that we might consider plotting and seeing if it has what, cut, what sort of influence it has. Um, and then the last one I think is particularly interesting where we, we looked at a frequency response plot um, about eight slides ago. And you might wonder, does that really, does that really mean anything? Um, is there any correlation between the error for a given part profile and acceleration and where that crossover frequency is? Probably there is. Um, it's natural to perhaps assume that a well-tuned system is going to give lower error than a poorly tuned system. But it would be nice to be able to quantify that with a set of curves or a set of deliverables that say for a given system, if you get a bandwidth that is 125 hertz for the linear axis and uh, 150 hertz for the rotary axis with, with such a phase margin, you should expect a given part error uh, or an error versus acceleration curve of a certain nature. And the last bit of future work that uh, might be interesting to consider is system simulation and modeling. In other words, predicting the error that you're going to get before you even run a part profile and turn your laser on. We should be able to actually run some parts, even if it's dry running parts and only looking at the encoder errors from the linear and rotary stage. We should be able to run some cycles for given feed rates and, more important, importantly, for a given sets of acceleration and have our motion controller report back to us what was the peak error that we experienced when I had that acceleration rate for a profile, run this, run this experiment across a number of different accelerations, plot all of those errors, and, have, and, and feel confident that we have a good model of what error versus acceleration looks like. What, what is that transfer function? What's that relationship? And that's the kind of raw data uh, that is shown in the top portion of this slide. Toward the bottom, uh, this is where we can make judgments as to what velocity should I pick. Clearly, I have to pick a velocity that's not too fast for my laser, but there's more to it than that. There should be, I should be able to decide what is an optimal velocity uh, to, to run at and still get to, to seek the best part profile without having to arbitrarily limit my or increase my acceleration and give me, give me worse part performance or part errors. So that's what this set of curves that, that says cycle time versus acceleration for various feed rates seeks to define. So each line is for a given feed rate in inches per second. And we plot them 
for cycle time versus acceleration. The purpose of the plot or the utility of this set of curves is that whenever we, in, whenever we arrive at the flat spot of the curve, it's no longer interesting to keep turning up the acceleration. So for instance, for the purple curve, for 15 inches per second, you can see that at an acceleration of about 30 inches per second squared, there's no value in increasing the acceleration. I've already peaked for velocity uh, with, with a 30 inches per second squared number, so there's no sense in trying to accelerate any harder. All I'm going to do is get to a flat velocity faster, give more error in my part, and still not improve my cycle time at all. So we should be able to run a set of simulations, generate this kind of data, and have as a deliverable this kind of a chart. So now I can pick the optimal velocity for whatever part error I, I choose to be acceptable for my profile. You've been very patient listening while, while I've rambled about on this topic. Um, I hope you found it interesting, and I certainly look forward to trying to answer any questions you might have. Okay, thank you, Scott. This really illustrates how sophisticated um, laser micromachining of cylinders has become. Uh, so we're now in the Q&A portion of the webcast. So to ask a question, uh, just type your question in the Q&A app at the bottom of the screen. Um, we have a few questions already. Uh, I will ask ask a few, a few, and if we have too many, then I, I won't be able to ask them all. But the ones I don't ask, we'll be able to have answered via email uh, later. So, uh, Scott, the first question. What do you mean by enhanced tuning as referenced on the curve in slide 18? Um, so let me return to slide 18. Uh, recall, this is the Bode plot. Um, so when we talk about enhanced tuning, or, or maybe even what I, what, whatever I, I might have uh, mentioned as being aggressive tuning at a couple of points during the presentation, um, this means what, what we call, at least at least at Aerotech, loop shaping. So we look at this Bode plot, this set of uh, a magnitude, a gain response, and a frequency or a, a phase response versus frequency, and we try to optimize it. So uh, at the heart of a Bode plot is a crossover frequency, which uh, maybe for the red line you might be able to squint real hard and see that that's about 90. At about 90 hertz is where we uh, we cross over zero decibels on the top curve, um, and then a, a phase margin, which is the difference between uh, 100, minus 180 degrees and my phase on the bottom chart. So again, at, uh, at that 90 hertz, uh, I, might, I might guess that I have a phase margin of about 30 degrees. But when, to answer the question specifically, the advanced tuning techniques that we should consider employing are manipulating the, these curves up and down on a very basic level, so in other words, changing my servo loop gains to make that magnitude curve go up and down. And as that magnitude curve goes up and down, obviously the point at which it crosses 0 dB moves to the left and right. So as I move it up, the crossover point moves to a higher frequency, and I get more nimble system response. It's important to consider the phase relationship, though, because if my phase margin it becomes close to zero, in other words, if the phase plot comes close to that minus 180 degrees of phase, that means that commands that I issue at that frequency may not be interpreted in the same direction that I want it to be. In other words, I become unstable. So I, have, I should be able to develop a set of advanced tools that allow me to move that up and down. And as I move that gain plot so that I get higher and higher crossover frequencies, um, I need to be able to manipulate either the gain or the phase plot with filters to hammer down peaks in that gain plot, which might cause me to go unstable. So I should be able to apply low-pass filters or notch filters or resonant filters to either enhance or to attenuate the, the response at any given frequency. And as I drop these filters in and I change the shape of what that frequency response looks like, this gives me the opportunity to continually increase it and increase it and increase it to get more and more bandwidth out of the system. Eventually, even an expert uh, tuner will run into a limitation on that, um, and that's probably where we've arrived with the red curves, where you might imagine that if we shift that up any more, uh, the peaks that we see on or around 400 hertz, those are going to pop up above, um, and I'll have a magnitude 
of greater than one there. So what that means is the system is responsive to noise, uh, to, to disturbances at that frequency, and the phase might be in the opposite direction. So I could become unstable at those frequencies. So it's a juggling act. It's a balancing act. But the more powerful controllers will, at the very least, give the tuner a chance to apply them, to apply filters, um, such as notch filters, resonant filters, things like this, and general loop shaping techniques. Um, at the very least, they will apply those tools or, or offer those tools. Um, in the best case, the controller should do it automatically. It should identify these resonances and stamp them out with the right, with the right notch filters, for instance, and automatically increase the, the, the bandwidth. So this is what I meant by advanced tuning techniques. I see. So just, just for my own uh, information, the system itself can drop in these filters, uh, the notch filters or, or whatever, um, in most cases, but then the user has also the ability to drop them in? Is yes, so there's works? a flex. Okay. Yep, yes, that, that, that's a good follow-up. Okay. So the motion, the motion controller yeah. itself can identify these peaks and drop them in. Um, furthermore, if the user identifies or has a particular application that needs a different kinds of response, we can still manually adjust it. I see, okay. Okay, so, uh, second question. How can I gather enough raw data to do some of the modeling and simulations mentioned toward the end of the presentation? So on the, the last uh, true slide that, that has true content on it, um, as we see here, you know, the top part of it does have a whole lot of data that's, that's kind, of, kind of pasted in there. And there's a couple of ways that you can accumulate or, or, or try to generate this much data. Uh, the first one is if you have systems on hand, um, you, you, you could dry run patterns. You could pick a candidate pattern and decide I'm going to run it at 10 different acceleration rates and uh, have, have a program running, which, which again, mo most of the motion control purveyors out there can supply these kinds of programs to monitor what the peak error is so that you can run the program with, an with a given set of accelerations and have it return to you what the peak error is. You conduct this experiment a number of times for a given part profile, and this allows you to, this is your raw data. Um, now, most most um, manufacturers are unlikely to have a number of suitably different mechanical setups to generate all of these curves, to have one that uses a, a generation three stent cutting platform and another one that's generation two, and maybe another one that's generation three and a half because they had a great idea and want to evaluate that too. Um, so it's, if you don't have all of those things on hand, then, for instance, we can, we can supply you a lot of this raw data. Uh, we can give you what that response curve looks like of, of part error versus acceleration. And then once, it, once you have that, you can pick what error you want to tolerate, and then that, that uh, spits out for you the acceleration. Okay. Can you provide additional detail on the better collet uh, or workpiece holding device, and what is used for the Generation 3 stent cutting system? So when we talk about better collets and work, workpiece holding devices, what we really mean is that, is that whenever that collet or workpiece holder clamps down on the device, um, it doesn't either radially or axially translate the device, and it doesn't uh, misalign the device with, from the, the axis of rotation after it clamps down. So that, that's what I mean by, by, that's what better means, and, and, and I, I appreciate that that probably doesn't address the question directly, so I'll try to do that now. Um, Generally, we seek to have higher and higher precision collets. So this means that, 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 that we don't have those errors and we don't have that, that, um, that misalignment uh, from the axis of rotation. And, and that's achieved generally by using uh, high, high precision micro bore collets. Um, I know the Levin workpiece holders are very popular. The so-called D and C style collets are actually quite good at that, at not translating the the workpiece on axis um, as, it, as the part is clamped and unclamped. Um, this is an open area of study. Uh, those, what I would call good collet workpiece holding devices, like the, the, the uh, Levin collets, um, those are very good down to a certain part size. Uh, when you start getting lower than, than fractional millimeters, when you start getting lower maybe than, than uh, smaller maybe than 500 microns, it becomes very difficult to find them to fit the, a given part diameter. Um, and one, but even more importantly, if you, even if you could find one, the inertia of that collet is enormous compared to the inertia of the part itself. And so that the rotary stage that's holding that collet can't get out of its own way. Um, that the, the inertia to torque ratio gets all blown up. 
So this is, as I mentioned, an area of open study um, to try to to try to invent um, a, a new workpiece holder. And this is something I can tell you, Aerotech uh, is interested in. Um, something that we are pursuing, and and uh, it's an open avenue of study for us. Um, I don't have a perfect response for that right now, but this is something that's being worked on not only by us, I'm sure elsewhere in the industry, and I think is going to be an area of concentration for stent cutting in years years, years to come. Um, the second part of the question okay. had to do with the Generation 3 stent cutting system. Uh, very specifically, that that is um, what Aerotech calls a vasculave platform, and uh, Maybe it's interesting to uh, to take a look at the picture. It's, uh, it's sort of zoomed in a little bit, but uh, the the generation three stent cutting system there does come closest to that optimization, that 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 three pronged optimization of driving through the center of mass, supporting about the center of stiffness, and sensing at the work at the uh, at the work point. Um, and this it's achieved. You might notice that the rotary stage is recessed in between two linear spars. Um, so those linear spars are are linear motors and bearings both. So this means that the linear motors are on either side of the center of mass of the rotary stage, so that level of optimization is, uh, is achieved or, or come close to it. Uh, likewise, the bearings are on either side of that rotary subassembly, and the subassembly itself is custom designed to, to have its stiffness optimized to try to achieve that level of optimization. Um, and inside those spars, this is probably where, where the, 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 uh, the optimization is furthest from perfect, is uh, sensing at the work point. So, Clearly, the work point is going to be way out at the end of those linear stages where the laser beam is going to be delivered. Uh, but even so, that's, that's about as optimal as, uh, as we could imagine it to be for, for the encoder locations near the nose of the rotary and along the linear spars. So that, that's what the Generation 3 cutting system infers. Okay, this next question is something I was curious about, too. How might the choice of laser affect the results shown in the curves, or would it affect them? Um, it, it, um, well, let's see. Let's get it. Let's get some of those curves up here. So let's assume that these are the curves uh, of interest when we talk about part throughput versus uh, versus motion cycle time. And on the surface, maybe maybe the cho choice of laser uh, will not be so important. Um, the choice of laser will influence the velocity, the maximum velocity that we can travel, um, and it may it may even influence how the motion controller can interact with the laser. Um, if it's a particularly exotic device and, and will not allow things like the PSO tool that we discussed earlier uh, to, to be used to interact with it, that comes into play. Um, but, but for the more general question, uh, the laser choice will, it will affect the velocity, the maximal velocity that we can use for stent cutting. Um, that may not be apparent on this curve, but it does have an influence because if the velocity of, that the laser can tolerate is suitably low, then curves such as these ones come into play. So if I know that my feed rate, let's say, is the worst one, is the slowest one, that eight inches per second, then clearly I should be totally uninterested in accelerating at 100 inches per second squared. So although the shape of the curves may not change, the influence on optimizing the, pro the problem definitely will, depending on the laser. Okay, we have time for one more question, um, kind of an interesting one. Early in the presentation, you talk about generations one through three of these stent processing systems. What do you think generation four might look like? So again, if we push back to, uh, to one of the earlier slides, um, hopefully it's apparent that there is some level of optimization that um, that's occurred over the years to arrive at generation three, what I would call the current generation. Um, if we try to imagine generation four, that's an interesting question. Um, earlier in the presentation, I I alluded maybe if somebody had an idea for generation 3.5, just that some slight improvement on what we see here uh, might be interesting to trace a set of curves for that, and and and, and I stand by that that interest. Uh, for generation four, I would think that it would have to be some fundamental change in the mechanical layout. Um, I, it may or may not be a rotary sitting on top of a linear stage. Um, it, it may not be a fixed laser point delivered to the workpiece. As we appreciate that the acceleration versus error relationship depends on moving masses and rotating inertias, 
uh, boy, maybe the best way to get around that is to totally eliminate the moving mass and the rotating inertia. Um, why not have a moving work point? Why not, why not, let's say, use a galvanometer to deliver the, the laser spot very swiftly over, over the part? Um, if we do that, maybe we could do it while the rotary is sitting still so there's no dynamic errors there. Um, or if we're confident enough in, in synchronization, maybe we could do it while the rotary is spinning at a constant velocity and uh, may, maybe stitch across uh, axially all the laser pulses at, just, at the right spots and build up the shape as the rotary spins continuously in one direction. Once again, if we're moving constant velocity, there's, um, th there should be no, there's no acceleration, clearly, uh, and therefore no dynamic errors. So um, perhaps it's something where we, where we just have a fundamentally different architecture instead of trying to improve on the given system. Okay, thank you, Scott. Would you like to make any closing remarks? Um, only that, once again, I appreciate the, the very good attendance we've had for today's event. Uh, I know everybody is very, very busy. You've been very generous with your time, and I sincerely hope that you've received uh, appropriate value for the time investment you've made. Thank you very much. Okay, well, on behalf of Laser Focus World and Penroll Corporation, I would like to thank Scott Schmidt of Aerotech for today's presentation, Acceleration versus Error, Balancing Performance for Cylindrical Laser Processing Applications. This presentation will be archived within 24 hours and can be accessed from the home page at www.laserfocusworld.com. A reminder, so it's so on demand, for those who are asking, uh, asking questions about can we uh, see this later, well, that's how you do it. You just go to the website. So a uh, reminder email message will, for the archive will be sent to registrants, complete with a link to the archive. We thank you for joining us today and look forward to future webcasts.